There are some really important blood vessels that you should be aware of for this um, upcoming chapter. So the first, first of all, this is a flow chart which um, may not appeal to everybody. I know it looks overwhelming when you start looking at it. However, when you um, look at the branches, it should hopefully make more sense. So I'd like to just go slowly through a little bit of it. And we're going to start with what you've learned. You've learned about the heart now. You've learned about the left ventricle of the heart. And this is going to be all systemic circulation. So it doesn't include any sort of pulmonary circulation. So the aorta, as it comes out of the heart from the left ventricle, you can see that the aorta leads to the left and the right coronary artery. So that would be for coronary circulation. It then goes to the system via the ascending aorta. And the ascending aorta then forms a curve called the aortic arch. And the three main branches of the aortic arch are the brachiocephalic trunk, first of all. It, um, you may also see in some like textbooks that they call it the brachiocephalic artery. But it's a... Um, Either one works. Uh, trunk's probably the best description just because it branches. Trunks always branch into other small blood vessels. So it also leaves, besides the brachiocephalic trunk, we have the left common carotid and the left subclavian artery. The great thing about this flowchart is it tells you the areas of tissue that this artery brings oxygen and nutrients towards. So, zooming back out, we can see that the left common carotid is going to go up towards the brain. And the brachiocephalic part of it leads to the right common carotid, which then splits to the right external carotid artery and the right internal carotid artery. And the important thing to remember about the aorta is... After it makes this turn, it then descends, so it's also referred to as the descending aorta. We also call it the thoracic aorta because that's it, the region where it's located in the thoracic cavity. Now, once it descends below the diaphragm, we refer to it as the abdominal aorta, but it's still the same main blood vessel. And here it's important to know the main branches from the abdominal aorta. There's the ciliate trunk, the uh, gonadal artery, and uh, we'll look at those on the next slide in more detail. So we're going to zoom in here to look at the abdominal aorta and its branches. And this will help you for lab as well. You need to remember these in order. There's five main branches right off of the abdominal aorta. There's the ciliate trunk first, then there is the superior mesenteric artery next. This is going to deliver blood to the proximal end of the intestines, the first part of the intestines. Then we have the renal artery, the gonadal artery, so that would be the testicular artery in men, the ovarian artery in women. Then the inferior mesenteric artery, which is going to deliver blood to the last part of the digestive system. So again, the word mesentery, when you hear that, you need to think GI tract. Then we have a split here of the abdominal aorta, and it splits to become the common iliac artery. So the common iliac artery is, is a different blood vessel. It's not a really a per se branch of the abdominal aorta. When it splits, it becomes the external iliac artery and the internal iliac artery, uh, femoral artery, which we see down here, popliteal artery is going to be when it gets to the knee area, and then it splits to deliver blood to the anterior tibial artery and the posterior tibial artery. One thing I want you to notice up here for the upper limb is that as the left subclavian artery comes out, as it branches off of the ascent or the arch of the aorta, it leads to the shoulder area. And you know the shoulder means subclavian artery. And the subclavian artery then leads to the axillary artery. 
So the way these blood vessels work is they're a lot like uh, some streets that are going to change name when you go through an intersection. It's the same road, but it's a different name. So the axillary artery is in the armpit, then it leads to the brachial artery, and then that splits at the elbow region to become the radial artery and the ulnar artery. Both of those then are going to lead to the deep palmar branch of the palm and then finally the digital arteries in each individual finger in each digit. So those are important to remember. So the next slide is a flow chart on the veins. So we're going to look at this a little more closely and when we're learning these blood vessels, remember we've already mastered in a and one you learn the body regions. So apply those body regions to the different blood vessels, to the arteries and to the veins as well. So for the veins, they're going back towards the heart, remember. So they're going to drain or merge, form unions into other veins. So a couple that I'd like to point out first is the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is going to receive blood from the lower limb. So what we see here is the common iliac arteries, the right common iliac artery, the left common iliac artery. It's taking deoxygenated blood and waste products from those tissue areas and merging back into the inferior vena cava. So the inferior vena cava travels all the way up back into the right atrium, which you have already learned. So the inferior vena cava drains the entire lower part of the body. So all of these that you see here, for example, the left and the right renal veins, they're going to merge or dump into the inferior vena cava. Our next slide is showing the diagram of the veins, kind of like what we saw before for the arteries. And um, one a couple important things to point out here. First of all, mer uh, veins are going to be much more superficial than arteries. So when you have blood drawn, they are going to put a needle in a vein, much more superficial. And that should make sense to you because you know that the blood pressure is much lower in a vein compared to an artery. So most of the time there are arteries and veins that share the same name. And I like to think of them as roadways that go in opposite directions. However, there are some exceptions. So in other words, there is a median cubital vein in our armpit area. I'm sorry, not armpit area, the um, elbow area. That's where blood is usually drawn from. And there's no median cubital artery. Also, there's a cephalic vein and there's no cephalic artery. There's a basilic vein and no basilic artery. Some of the other exceptions include the great saphenous vein. And the great saphenous vein is going to be very uh, superficial as well. But one important interesting fact about the great saphenous vein is that it's used for cardiac bypass surgery. They call it a cabbage for short. But cardiac bypass surgery is going to allow for the um, bypass of a blocked coronary artery. Another important structure to see in the venous system is the hepatic portal system. Sometimes it's just referred to as the portal vein. It's different than the hepatic vein. The hepatic vein is going to be taking deoxygenated blood and waste products from the hepatocytes, the liver cells themselves, and delivering them back into the inferior vena cava eventually. But what's important about the hepatic portal vein is it's an entire system. It's formed by the union of the splenic and the superior mesenteric veins. So it carries nutrient-rich blood to the liver. So imagine that once the nutrients have been, they've been, um, in the intestines and they are now there for processing, they're going to go to the processing plant, which is the liver via the hepatic portal vein. So this 
hepatic portal vein drains the majority of the gastrointestinal tract. So that's a very important point to know. Our next slide shows us an example of a common anastomosis. And we have lots of anastomoses in the body. It's more common to find anastomoses in veins because there are always collaterals there. So a uh, anastomosis, remember, is a collateral. And so in this case, this is an arterial anastomosis, anastomoses for plural. And that arterial anastomosis is referred to as the circle of Willis, also called the cerebral arterial circle. And it's made up of these various blood vessels, the anterior communicating artery, as well as the anterior cerebral artery, posterior communicating artery, posterior cerebral artery, and also some of these blood vessels like the middle cerebral artery. Our next slide is showing a flow chart on the left side and also the blood vessel image on the right side. And it's important for you to identify some of these specific ones in this case that are gonna branch off of the right common carotid artery. So remember that the brachiocephalic trunk is going to lead to the brachial artery, but also the subclavian artery. And that subclavian artery then branches into the right subclavian artery. And we see it further branch into these various blood vessels up here. So there's blood that has to go to the thyroid, blood that has to go to the tongue region, the face, the occipital region, the maxillary region, as well as the superior temporal artery. You may remember that the superior temporal artery is a location where you can actually feel a pulse. This slide is showing some important adaptations that occur in the fetus. So we want to look first look at the, um, to orient yourself, first of all, the fetus is on the left-hand side and the newborn is on the right-hand side and you're going to see some specific differences. So in the fetus, in fetal circulation, the liver and the lungs are not working at that point. So there has to be important bypasses or shunts that kind of override this and allow blood to be mixed. So the first one, uh, actually there's two that are in the heart region. There's the ductus arteriosus and there's also the foramen ovale. And those both are going to close when the child is born. So in fetal circulation, these shunts are going to allow for oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to actually um, mix. And at birth, for the foramen valve specifically, there is a, the pressure in the left atrium is going to actually force closure of this hole in the interatrial septum leading to the fossa ovalis. So what you see in green would be what's in the newborn. So the ductus arteriosus leads to the ligamentum arteriosum. The foramen oval, once it closes, it then forms a depression called the fossa ovalis. And let's look a little further down here now at the placenta. So the placenta is going to be the temporary organ that's, that helps to feed the fetus. It um, helps to supply nutrients and oxygen. So when we look at the umbilical cord going from the placenta to the fetus, we see that in the umbilicus, there is a couple different blood vessels. There's the umbilical vein and there's the umbilical artery. And it's important for you to remember that the, these are two other exceptions in that, remember, the pulmonary artery is going to have deoxygenated blood. The pulmonary vein has oxygenated blood. So too is true as well for the umbilical blood vessels. In this case, the umbilical vein carries oxygenated blood, as you can see, from the placenta to the um, inferior vena cava to go back into the heart. And the umbilical artery 
takes deoxygenated blood from the fetus, the fetus back to the placenta for gas exchange since the lungs are not working at that point. So the last adaptation is for the liver and that's called the ductus venosus. And the ductus venosus at birth closes to become a ligament called the ligamentum venosum. 